Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy of the abundance of your grace and mercy to glorify your resurrection with pure hearts to celebrate your victory with holy hymns and to proclaim your might with pure tongues. We thank you for your love and we worship you crying out, Christ is risen, he is truly risen. To you be glory, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the living and immortal one who gave life to his people by his cross and salvation to his church and happiness to his flock by his resurrection. When he appears, he will give joy to his inheritance. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. We worship and we praise you, O only begotten Son. You descended into the darkness of the tombs and worked wonders in the realm of the dead. By your resurrection you freed the captives and by your voice you awaken the righteous and the just who had gone to their rest in the sleep of death. You gathered the nations to worship you and to proclaim your salvation. They cry rejoice and they cry out. On Friday the king endured pain and was crucified. And today, victory has been achieved by his resurrection. On Friday, a lance pierced his sacred side. And this day, in his compassion, the waters of baptism flow forth. On Friday, he was crowned with thorns. And today, he has adorned his church with a crown of immortality. Today is the day of rejoicing in the resurrection. Today is the day of rejoicing for all who have gone to the rest in the hope of the resurrection. Today the fragrance of this incense, the church and her children celebrate and sing hymns of glory saying, O Christ, our life, you have saved us by your passion and have given us life by your resurrection. Now renew our image by your grace. Clothe our bodies with the power of the Spirit so that we may shine in the robe of glory and in this light see you the true bridegroom. In your grace make us and all the faithful departed worthy of your heavenly kingdom, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Sacrifice yourself for us, we give you thanks. O oh, incense of forgiveness, we worship you for you have brought us close to your Father, enriched us by your birth, purified us by your baptism, sanctified us by your crucifixion. Reconciled us to the Father by your resurrection, raised us up by your ascension, and you adorned us with the gifts of your Spirit. Now, O Lord, accept our incense and fill us always with your sweet fragrance, so that our tongues may never cease in giving thanks to you, now and forever. Kaddishat 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 Praise you with purity and listen to 
the Holy Scriptures, to you be glory forever. is rejoicing for her shepherd truly rose Christ who died for his people conquered death to give new life Lord our God you accepted what the just had offered you now accepting your mercy from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and your children forever. My heart's desire and prayer to God on their behalf is for salvation. I testify with regard to them that they have zeal for God, but it is not discerning. For in their unawareness of the righteousness that comes from God and their attempt to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for the justification of everyone who has faith. Moses writes about the righteousness that comes from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we preach. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. For scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, enriching all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise be to God always. of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo Elokuluchuna. 
From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, And while they were yet speaking about these things, Jesus stood in their midst and he said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and they were terrified, and they thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions now arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, and that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still incredulous because of joy, and they were amazed, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of baked fish, and he took this, and he ate it in front of them. And he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was yet with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning first from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses to these things. This is the truth, peace be with you. And I testify that they have zeal for God, but that their zeal is not discerning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The they that St. Paul is referring to are the Jewish people. So the letter to the Romans deals with faith as the instrument and as the principle, the origin of our justification, what heals us. And of course, he's answering questions in a large sense to the Romans of the people of Israel clearly have not converted. Well, thousands and thousands of Jews have converted. The people of Israel have not converted. So it becomes the question of, with the coming of the Messiah, what about Israel? And what about the pagans? Because of course, the Romans to whom this letter is being written, a large part of them, if not the majority of them in Rome, will be converting from out of paganism. So what the letter of the Romans does is it encompasses everyone together, both Israel and all of the non-Israelites, and, and St. Paul teaches that they are under a minority, if you like, before the coming of the Messiah. In other words, the nations of the earth were not matured in the ways of God. Israel had been taught, Israel had a teacher, Israel had the law of Moses, but that was it. The same thing that when you're in fifth grade you have teachers, you're making progress, you're moving forward but you are still a child. You are still in your minority. This is why he says in this epistle that the end, the end of the law, the purpose of the law is Christ. 
And so when he says that they have zeal for God, but that their zeal is not discerning, it's because they're trying to make the law to be something that it is not, that it cannot be, a source of healing and of justification. The law, St. Paul says, by saying that the end of the law, the purpose of the law is Christ, he's saying that this is a pedagogical, it moved them, it was to teach and to perform, and to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. So that when the Messiah comes and they reject the Messiah and hang on to the law, they're actually falling into superstition and idolatry. They're making it be something. They're making it be a source of salvation that it cannot be. And for the pagans, well, those poor things, they have no clue as to what's going on. At least the Jews are better off than that. But everyone in the past, before the coming of the Messiah, every human being, every nation, every culture, was bumbling around. The Jews were doing the best, Israel was doing the best, but it was still in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. So when he says that their zeal was not discerning, he's saying they're misplacing their religiosity, their sense of religion they're misplacing. And the thing that I wanted to call attention to you, that's, that's the basis of the epistle, but at this mass what I wanted you to consider was the icon that I have put out. This is known as the Vladimirskaya on the tetrapod. The tetrapod's up here. There's an icon over there too, it's true, but this one I'm talking about. It's known as the Vladimirskaya, or the Virgin of Vladimir. Vladimir is a city. It's also a person, but it's referring to this icon being in the city of Vladimir. And the reason why I wanted to put it out is because there is a lot of oh, dare we say, undiscerning zeal and a slightly hysterical aspect. Well, we have wars all over. We have Yemen that is still dying of starvation and still in civil war. We have Ethiopia that is in civil war and starvation. And yet, the only thing that the West seems to be obsessed with is the Ukraine. It is tragic. There's no doubt, every war is tragic. But you must have a zeal which is discerning as to what's actually going on. It's not a political sermon we're having today. What I bring you is Our Lady of Vladimir, so that our prayers be turned to these poor people, both of the Ukraine and of Russia. It is an extraordinarily complex history that the Rus possesses. The Rus converse, converts in 988 under Saint Vladimir, who was chieftain, chief of these Varingian Slavic people, they are part Viking Swedes, Scandinavians, who inter first they came in to like raid the area of the Slavs coming down the rivers. You know, the Vikings went everywhere. The Normans went everywhere. They eventually take over even places like Sicily. They're all over the place. And they entered among the Slavic peoples living in those grasslands and that central area in order to take them into bondage and sell them as slaves. It's why our English word slave comes directly from Slav as a people. We call them basically the slaves. That relation etymologically. But eventually these Nordic people settled down in the area amongst the slaves and their trading and their merchandising. Merchandising, of course, being one of the things being people being sold. They're not Africans. These are white people being sold in slavery. Slavery is an economic question. It is not a question of race. That's another sermon someday, maybe. But of course, what happens, people are people, right? So eventually, these Northmen, they intermarry with the slaves. And they're known by the people of Constantinople as being Varingians. And so these people become the Rus, the Rus. And it's centered on Kiev. And in 988, after his mother had, his grandmother had converted, Saint Olga, Olga had embraced Christianity, and there were Christians in Kiev, but the Duke, the Prince of Kiev, decided everyone's going to convert. And you have the mass conversion and baptism taking place of the people of Rus, who are essentially living in Kiev and the southern parts down, to, down, not even all the way to Crimea, but that area is where the Rus and going up northern. The geography of the area, of course, eventually spreads. And now you know the nation state of Russia that goes from the Pacific Ocean all the way out to Poland. You know this huge, vast area. The Poles and the Russians 
call this area the Ukraine. Ukraine in the language means the borderlands. And as you have the movement of all the peoples around and the expansion of Rus, you have a Russia now that is centered upon Moscow. But the origins of the whole history is in Kiev. This is why what you're watching is so barbaric and so savage because this is a civil war. And so the same way that our American civil war was so savage because it's brothers fighting against brothers, this is exactly what you're witnessing now. But it has a complicated history. The western part of the Ukraine for oftentimes was under Lithuania, under Poland, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is very western. But that river that Kiev is on, the Dnieper, the eastern parts never were part of those western European political sites. That's why your Catholics are in the western part of the Ukraine because of the influence of the Catholic Austrian Empire upon them. It's why the division is at the river which is why all this fighting that goes on is all around these territorial things which date for a thousand years now. So again, there is no excuse for invading people. There is no excuse for civil war. But civil war, human nature being what it is, these things happen. There was a news broadcast yesterday in which they were interviewing the poor Ukrainian refugee women because now they're stuck in Poland. And Poland does not have women's health care. They don't have abortion, and this is horrible. And so NPR was broadcasting a news broadcast of these poor Ukrainians under the most oppressive regime of the Poles, who have clearly, you've seen the news stories, opened their arms and just welcomed these people in by the hundreds of thousands. And yet the news story is Ukraine was a free country with the most liberal abortion laws in Europe, among some of the most liberal. This is a, a war that encompasses many things, not just territory, not harbors, but it also has God at the center. It's not to say that the Russians are filled with God and the Ukrainians aren't. It's to say that religion is a major part of this war. That's never going to be told you in a news story. Cardinal Sarah wrote a whole article, probably about a month ago, on the aspects of this war which are being forgotten. And one of the things he brings up is he says that the church, orthodox that it is, the church in Russia has regained exactly the same position, very much this position it had before the communist revolution. When the, when this, when the Soviet Union collapsed in, in 1989, 25% of the population claimed any kind of association with the church, 25%. And now after the 90s and the early 2000s, over 78, 80% of the population is now baptized. No one tells the story of what's been going on as conversion of Russia. But for Catholics, we shouldn't be surprised by that because we know Russia is part of the story of Fatima. Our Lady told us that Russia will have a central position in the future. But when I say Russia, I don't mean the nation state. I mean the people of Rus who are fighting a civil war. And the reason why I wanted Our Lady of Vladimir to come out is to understand this is an icon that began in Kiev in the 12th century. It was clearly, most people consider that it was painted in Constantinople. It had been a gift to one of those early princes of Rus from out of Constantinople. But by the 14th century, it has moved to the city of Vladimir that's where its title is. And from the 12th century to the 14th century, for almost 250 years, it's in Vladimir. Vladimir is a city that's east of Moscow. So this icon encompasses the history of Rus. And as she finishes in the 15th century, she's taken to, the icon is taken to Moscow. Because Moscow is now becoming, it was nothing at the time of Kiev in 988. It was an outpost but becoming more and more central to the whole story of Rus, the icon is taken. And there, from Moscow, it remains for another 200 years in Moscow, in the cathedral, the Dormition. After the communist revolution, this icon was taken and put in a museum by the atheistic communist revolution, the Bolsheviks. That's not surprising. But in the 1990s, 
It became a source of litigation because the Russian Orthodox Church said, but this belongs to us, not to the state. And there was a compromise that was made, as many things have been done in Russia since then. Thousands of churches have been built in the last 20 years in Russia with state funds, replacing the churches that were destroyed by the Bolsheviks. And this icon became one of those compromises in which technically it will still belong to the state museum, but they have built an entire underground passageway to go to a church in which it actually is enshrined. So the church, the only way you can get to the icon, liturgies, masses are offered there regularly, and you can go and pray there, but you get there by going through the museum. That was their compromise in 1992. It is also said that Stalin, when the Nazis attacked Moscow during World War II, the invasion of Russia, that Stalin had this icon flown by military planes encircling around Moscow. It's a very strange thing, I know. Russia is a very strange place. And it's a very strange place, especially in the modern world. So without going into any more details, just to say it is complex, it is profoundly attached to the question of what religion is going on in central Eurasia. And this icon is central to everything. She starts in Kiev, she goes to places east of Moscow, and this icon finishes in Moscow. It encircles the entire history of what you watch on the news every single day, nonstop. Better that we have recourse to Our Lady of Vladimir than to CNN or Fox or whatever else and whatever commentary, because none of them are actually dealing with the true substance that's going on, which there really is battle of religion and faith and Christ essential to all of these things. So I encourage you also to go and look up Cardinal Sarah's article that he wrote last month or so. You can obviously find it easily. And I ask you that from the fullness of your heart you pray for these people, that you pray also for the conversion of these people. This is the wishes of Our Lady of Fatima. Russia holds a central aspect for the future message of what is meant to take place for the conversion of the world ultimately. Not that Russia is herself directly going to cause that, but we know that she is central to the message of Fatima of the conversion of the world and of repentance and conversion. So, in a very complex history, play for all those who suffer and in the misery that takes place and pray for justice and for the glory of God to be manifest in these issues. And may Our Lady of Vladimir and the beauty that you have here, it's known as an icon of Eleusa, Eleusa. It's one of the styles of the icons, which means mercy, compassionateness, tenderness. So whenever you see the icons in which the Christ child and the mother have their faces together, that is the style of Eleusa, of tenderness, of mercy. And we ask that she intervene for us today under this title, that she bring peace, that she bring justice, and that she bring reign of the kingdom of Christ to the world. And may her prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Vladimir Skyom, who told Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Rita of Cassia. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue with the Anaphora of the Twelve Apostles on page 754. 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, of love and faith that are pleasing to God. peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with all pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim. Sich vor men hamro men mayo, 
Barachu Kadesh Uyamil Talmita Karomara Sabishtaw Mehne Kulhu Hono Denita Demo Dila Diatiki Hadato Dahlo Faikun Wahlov Sagi Mete Shadu Meti Heb Husoyan Hombe Hoyan Alam Alami Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in memory of me until I come again. salvation and we ask you to have mercy on your worshipers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time to reward all people justly according to their deeds for this your church employs you and through you and with you implores your father saying sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith with blameless lives and with purity and holiness. May they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them, for you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord 
Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Rita of Cassia, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest hoping in you awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life accept the offerings we present you on their behalf and have mercy on them in your kingdom through our Lord Jesus who is without sin we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. and holiness, so that through them 
we may be forgiven and be made holy. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, let us be in the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your faithful blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to You be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Thank you, Lord God and Father, 
And we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokolokun. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.